uh, it's quite a pleasure to be here to be moderating the session and I welcome my fellow panelists to this uh, great session. My name, is, as it has been said already, it's Manfred Sankoloba, the CEO of Botswana Exporters and Manufacturers Association. And I welcome my colleagues. Um, I welcome my colleagues. I welcome Timothy. I welcome uh, Charles. I welcome Phyllis to, to, to the platform. Uh, so we will be, of course, uh, talking to our uh, topic of today that, uh, of course, that speaks to acceleration of ICT within the manufacturing industry. And we will be talking much about how it, it really is currently in Africa itself. Have we really gone that far in our manufacturing space to embrace the uh, ICT in order to enhance uh, our production level? As we know that Africa, in many cases, would be known of uh, importation of many things instead of asking uh, the, the, the initiators or the innovators of certain uh, consumable goods, such as, of course, the ICT uh, goods. Um, and as one of the speakers has said, that ICT is actually an enabler. It's not a goal. It's an enabler to, to simplify the processes and ensure that uh, manufacturing um, actually it, you know meets its desired needs uh, such as sustainability uh, such as higher quality and of course fire construction and also uh, has a much much effect on the, the cost of production as it uh, has uh, that impact on it of lowering the, the cost of production today i think uh, we will start of course with with our lady they say ladies first so we will give our lady first uh, to go on to <laughs> tell us about uh, her, her you know her take on the on the on our topic of today and also give us a brief, brief background on how far they have gone in her respective country in terms of accelerating the ICT within the manufacturing industry so over to you Phyllis. Um, thanks thanks a lot and uh, good morning good afternoon for those who could be joining from uh, different uh, time zones. It's a pleasure to be here today uh, to just share a few thoughts on uh, ICT and some of the initiatives uh, that we've undertaken as the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, uh, which is the organization where I work. We are the business membership organization that represents industry and manufacturing sector in Kenya. And this is something we've done as an association for the last 62 years. So if you look at the context uh, before COVID-19, the world was positioning itself for the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, previous revolutions that we had seen globally were inspired by the need to fulfill upcoming needs. Uh, in the past, we saw mass production, high speed and bulk movement of goods and people and other things. And the necessity for these drove people to imagine, inspire and innovate. This therefore led to mechanized processes in various fields, including agriculture, transport, and manufacturing. And uh, that is similar to what has happened with the pandemic, which has also resulted in profound change. It's radically shifted uh, the globe. And uh, as we've complied with the measures and had to slow down our activities, uh, we've seen a lot of change in how we do uh, business. Uh, because of that, we've seen a lot of innovation. People have had to innovate uh, to fill some of the supply chain gaps that have been caused by the pandemic so that they are able to meet the demand for critical essential items that they require to fight the pandemic. And now we're at the stage where we're looking at rebuilding the pandemic with the vaccines and, and uh, hopefully the ability for us to uh, try and move back to the new normal. Uh, and based on that, we need to develop structures that work in the presence or an absence of a crisis. So for us at CAM, we recognize that ICT is one of the ways through which business remained afloat uh, during the pandemic and has really been a launching pad uh, for the rebound even as we move forward. Uh, that's why we continue to work together with our manufacturers and our members and encourage them to increase their uptake of automation and also embrace industry 4.0. What we do is we do a lot of capacity building. We hold sensitization forums for manufacturers in partnership with different development partners like GIZ and UNIDO on the benefits that come with automation. And additionally, we've also done some research and studies just to understand the state of play um, around uh, ICT uh, uptake in Kenya and uh, uh, how we can really use uh, 
digital ICT to grow manufacturing and create jobs. So we have a policy document, if you go to our website, uh, on the same that we did together with uh, ODI from the UK. And we also advocate to government so that they create an enabling environment uh, that can really encourage the uptake of these technologies by industry. So that's, that's, that's what we're doing. Um, in terms of the policy framework, uh, you can confirm whether I should go all through or uh, please go ahead. You have a minute. Okay. Just less than a minute. Just go ahead. Yes. I have less than a minute. Oh. Okay, that's yeah. fine. So yes, I mentioned we've done uh, some research work. So the document is called How to Grow Manufacturing and Create Jobs in a Digital Economy, the 10 Policy Priorities for Kenya. So it has policy framework where we've tried to identify um, some of the things that we need to do at least at a national level. And I think it could resonate with other countries. Um, some of the key things it addresses related to the need to build digital infrastructure, including the increase of access to digital services and updating policies on data, other recommendations around boosting the competitiveness of the manufacturing sector in the country uh, so that uh, we can have a more digitalized economy. We also are proposing managing the digital change in an inclusive and sustainable manner uh, so that also all businesses can be able to take advantage of it, whether they are large or small businesses. So those are some of the things we've been doing so far, and uh, I'll be able to give more detail as we move forward in the conversation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Phyllis. I think you, you've really touched on great points, such as innovation and also the supply chain, that uh, it really has a direct impact on on, on such, I think without you know taking more time on, on on what you just said, we will of course give Charles. I know that South Africa is, is a bit advanced when we look at African landscape in terms of utilization of ICT, especially in the manufacturing sector. Also, Charles, so what what kind of frameworks do you think? Uh, I know that there is an element, of course, of political will in in, in in a lot of areas, especially in the ease of doing business, of course, and uh, and of course, the direct impact on policy framework, and also to ensure that the ICT in manufacturing is facilitated. How have we done in South Africa to ensure that such has a direct positive impact on 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 um, uh, on utilization of ICT within the the manufacturing sector? Charles, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Mandra. Uh, thank you, everyone who attended the session. Uh, the I, I will say like in in South Africa, uh, I will say I wouldn't look at it per se in South Africa, but though I'll be in talking from the context of South Africa, uh, I will say industrial smart industries. Uh, it's more about a collaborative view, and it's a shared it's a shared service uh, model because it's more around a risk reward a risk approach to say that uh, let me share the risk to say that no companies has a big capital to stomach all the all the risks that are that exist uh, within the the industry looking at the the growing trend of of cyber especially around cyber security so is that you need to manage your risk and look at the comp the production companies that have been hit by ransomware some they didn't understand to say that uh, that is a no pay uh, policy things like those and you need to develop to say that a uh, have mentality to, to to outsource because we are well aware that uh, Africa in terms of IT skills uh, we are in shortage and the the wisdom uh, I will say the wisdom from in terms of uh, development from industry perspective we are still junior or we are still infant in that regards though there's pockets uh, within South Africa that's, that has competed with the with the world but it's not enough uh, so industries if you look in south in south africa or in africa perspective they are still looking at around a manual process uh, uh, overview and people need to look at technology as a as a I will take it from an enabler perspective to a disruptor to say that uh, for you to realize your value and your return on investment, 
you need to look into how can you innovate and how can you uh, spend less and, and, and prioritize where your products, uh, you will have a finished product uh, with, with a less risk. So approaching with a less risk, it means you must have a good qualitative partners on the board. And we are well aware that we have uh, global companies uh, that are willing to, to participate with us. So that's why on the proposal to say that uh, us moving into a smart industry as Africa as a whole, we need to head to develop, we need to start at the academical level, uh, revolutionize uh, the academical world in terms of like move away from the old learning system uh, to, to the smart uh, universities, uh, have Africa uh, representative uh, smart universities, let African engineers and those who are participating in the industry uh, have the bodies of knowledge whereby they can develop best practices. Because if you look in, in terms of Africa, we, the reason why we are still lacking behind is because of we don't develop a, a best practice standard. We just adopt from Europe or from China uh, that, that, that is like uh, meant to be calibrating product that we are manufacturing. So one way of, of doing that is to uh, regionalize a body of, of knowledge, which will help us in terms of building the intellectual capital that Africa needs uh, to build product that can compete in the world. And that will also help you to say that when you outsource, you, when you secure your whole value chain, you know what partners to call because of it will be tailored to, to our requirements and to our region and demographics, then you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be spending much. Uh, if you look at COVID, a lot of companies went underground because of they couldn't uh, identify where, uh, where to outsource some of their value chain uh, services, which could have sustained them uh, until now. And also make sure that all the governments, uh, at the end of the day, they have a country technology or an innovation office executives, those that will account to say that they are the one that are tasked with stimulating uh, innovation within each and every country or each and every region, then there be a, an advisory that will also make sure that governments are in line with, with the future. Because if you look now, uh, in terms of smart cities, uh, countries or continents are talking of smart cities, uh, but we as uh, uh, within Africa, we are still trying to say that we are still struggling with fourth industrial revolution, yet there's an already an architecture uh, of to say that uh, uh, fifth industrial revolution uh, has been planned. So one way or the other is to be, uh, to, to sit on the table and not overlook the table. So us, we must be proactive and not sit, uh, be spectators. And also even the, the political will uh, must, must inject to say that allow the young generation, stimulate them to be innovative and support those because of that's the only way uh, innovation provide uh, jobs. So without innovation, uh, you'll still follow the old, or, or I will say the, the Mesian process. And when the world move, you will be lacking behind and your product will be uh, outsmarted by those who are using technology and those who are trying to be efficient in terms of production. Sorry. Thank you, Charles. I think that was a very great uh, insightful uh, elaboration on, 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 on that. And the fact that you actually mentioned uh, an issue of collaboration and also, uh, you know, but tracing on the fact that it's very important that uh, Africa comes together. And we, we, we now in the, in the times of uh, where we are celebrating or welcoming the AFCFTA, which of course it has been seen as the light or the hope for Africa to, you know, act and be, you know, integral in an integral manner to ensure that there is, um, a clear way of, of working together harm, harmoniously and also for, for African countries to easily identify themselves within the, the whole blocks, the, the whole African block uh, value chain. 
So I think there is hope on that uh, particular one. It's, it's something, it's an advice that is very practical at, 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 at this particular time. So I think we, we are going to quickly jump to Timothy and uh, allow you to introduce yourself and also give us your, your summary on the, on the, on, or your, your take on the, on the subject of uh, leveraging up uh, ICT technologies in the in, in manufacturing sector. And also, of course, it will be interesting to hear from the, uh, the government perspective as to how do how, is, is government ready to embrace ICT to closer. allow to enable private sector to, mm. to actually uh, move forward from yeah. this new phase that is currently yet, as, as Charles yeah. has alluded to. So welcome, Timothy, to, 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 to the, to the yeah. platform. Please. Yeah, yes. thank you. Yeah. Thank you, panel chair. Uh, my name is Timothy Were yeah. from the yeah. Ministry yeah. of yeah. ICT. Um, sorry, I think there's some interference there. Charles? Yeah. Hey, Charles, Charles, please mute. Please mute yes. on your side. Thank you. Yes, so as I was saying, I'm Timothy Were from the Ministry of ICT in Kenya. I hope I'm audible. Okay, yeah. So um, I think this is a very interesting topic and I thank the organizers of this um, conference for inviting me over. Uh, what I say as government, first of all, and as the chair of our manufacturing um, association has said, there's a legal and policy framework that is um, being put in place to encourage ICT adoption, not only in manufacturing, but uh, in the broad spectrum of business, uh, in academia and other sectors um, uh, of life. Uh, we have a very robust intellectual uh, property protection uh, laws so that where we have the patents and all the copyrights uh, being well secured. I think this is usually a fear, especially when you go digital, since it's very easy to copy and you know, duplicate uh, intellectual property. Apart from that, the issue of data protection has come in very strongly. And I'm happy to announce that Kenya has already implemented the Data Protection Act. And uh, we have a newly appointed Data Protection Commissioner. So they are working on the regulations on the protection of data. And you know, uh, manufacturing concerns uh, produce a lot of data, which can maybe fall in the hands of their um, you know, competitors. Uh, we also are in the process of enacting a critical infrastructure uh, protection bill or act. And uh, some of the manufacturing concerns are listed as critical infrastructure especially those that do deal with the uh, uh, drugs and vaccines, those that deal with foodstuffs, but those that deal with chemicals, um, uh, they are listed here. And when we talk of critical um, infrastructure protection, we are looking at both the plant itself and the infrastructure that serves the plant, the road, the water, the power, and even the ICT. And then, of course, as mentioned by earlier speakers, there's the issue of cybercrime. We've also passed a cybercrime and computer misuse act to be able just to protect whoever is using the computer. And then there's also a very vibrant innovation and incubation uh, environment that tries to promote innovation. Um, uh, we are setting up infrastructure and we started with the um, you know, fiber uh, infrastructure, which uh, we've done almost 10,000 kilometers of targeting our administrative uh, units. Those are the counties and the major sub counties. And so the manufacturing concerns, which are usually based in these headquarters, will be able to tap on this. There's also the incubation uh, and special economic zones that are coming up. And these are uh, based on smart uh, city concept. We have one that is mainly IT, the Konza Technopolis um, uh, special economic zone. And then there are others slated in uh, Naivasha and Mombasa and Athi River 
where the government uh, intends to supply this uh, smart concept so that whoever sets up shop there would be able to plug into the digital um, environment straight away. In addition, as has been mentioned by the other speakers, there's the issue of training. We have adopted ICT at technical and at university level, of course, from lower primary school, but uh, at technical and university level, we have uh, very robust in mechatronics, uh, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and this is all geared towards providing the workforce that would be able to deal with the smart manufacturing, automated manufacturing, both as end users and also as innovators to be able to, you know, push uh, these lines. So I think uh, maybe that would be the setup. I would have maybe other points to add later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Timothy. It, it does sound like promising. Uh, it sounds like uh, Kenya has really advanced in this particular space. Uh, I'm going to give you a follow-up question and say, what will it take for, for, for developing countries? What do you think is the role of developing countries to ensure that uh, the other countries catch up, uh, to ensure that they, they, the other countries also have, you know, they, they are leveling up to, to, the, to, to, to the level where you are at as Kenya, and of course, and, and many other countries that, has really, that have really advanced in, in ICT. What is it that needs to be done? What can be done by countries that have already advanced to assist those that are still leaking behind? Or to, okay. to make them catch up? Yeah, thank you. Uh, one of these is uh, technology transfer. Uh, we, we in the developing countries suffer from uh, dumping of obsolete uh, technology. So you find that we are using 30, 40, 50 year old machines that uh, look very advanced, but uh, are very old. So we need um, up to date technology transfer and uh, we need to come up with anti-dumping uh, laws and regimes to stop us uh, getting ancient technology and ancient uh, machines. And in this way, we will be able to, you know, uh, try and catch up in the technology space. We also need to enforce standards. I think part of the reasons why we have not automated or developed our manufacturing sector is that uh, the consumers accept very low or very poor standards uh, of products, uh, goods and services, uh, which uh, may not need a high level of precision, automation and accuracy, right? So if we enforce the standards, then it means the manufacturers also will have to get up-to-date machines and up-to-date uh, methodologies um, uh, for production. Uh, another way maybe of uh, catching up would be the collaboration that has been uh, spoken about. I think manufacturers are a bit uh, secretive. Uh, Phyllis, maybe you'd uh, forgive me on that. Um, uh, they don't like sharing, you know, uh, what they are doing. They don't like sharing uh, their processes. So if we have more collaboration, if we have innovators on the shop floors, just to see what is happening and give suggestions on improvements, then we'd be able maybe to catch up uh, with the developing uh, world. And finally, I think there is a concern on cybersecurity. When you go the IoT, when you automate, then there's always a window of somebody remotely messing up with your processes. So I think uh, cybersecurity needs to be enforced We've seen the example from Estonia when the government was attacked. We've seen the example of uh, Iranian nuclear plants uh, being attacked remotely. And recently we saw in the US, there was an um, oil pipeline that was uh, disabled. Uh, and you know it really messed up the supply chain of oil uh, in some states in the US. So I think... Um, uh, that cyber security assurance and uh, strategies need to be in place 
to be able to give the manufacturers the comfort that their automated systems will be able to work as they expect. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Timothy. I think you've raised very interesting points there. Uh, and of course, I would want uh, Phyllis to come in uh, quickly on that one. <laughs> what, what do you think uh, needs to be done by developing countries to, to accelerate those that are still lagging behind in ICT? What needs to be done? I know um, Charles had, had mentioned an issue of having a, 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 you know, a regionalized body that would somehow be in existence to allow that there is a smooth transaction or there is a smooth uh, working together within the African countries. But what is your take? What needs to be done? How can we be caught behind? Because some of us from where we are sitting, we are still way behind. When I'm listening to Charles, I'm like, okay, I'm still in the dark uh, ages here. <laughs> so what? how can we be helped to, to, come, to come to Charles' level, to, to, to join in where they are in their space? Um, thanks, thanks for the question and uh, interesting listening to both Charles and Timothy and the comments. Um, I agree with you that maybe if we take a step back and just try and understand what are some of the challenges that are making it difficult for manufacturers to embrace ICT, to embrace digitalization and all of these technologies within their business, then maybe we can address uh, these issues. Uh, one of the basic ones at very basic level is the high cost of capital because investment in this technology is moving even into the fourth industrial revolution and, and, and all those upgrades require additional amount of capital by businesses. But in African countries, we know that the cost of capital is quite high and that's something that we need to look at and address. And also the lack of availability of credit. Not only is it high, in some areas, the credit is not even available to enable businesses to upgrade to this type of technologies. Another very basic issue is even the issue of electricity, the cost of power in our countries and uh, issues around even the reliability and stability of such power. Uh, that definitely affects the ability to uptake um, some, some, some of these technologies. If you look at also a lot of uh, the, the, the technologies that have been developed uh, under the fourth industrial revolution, you find that uh, the development, the IP, the intellectual property of this uh, of these technologies is held by um, maybe ten countries in the world. So, ninety percent of the technologies developed are held by around ten percent. That's a study that was carried out by UNIDO, are held by about ten countries. So it means also um, the like. and becomes a challenge. So I agree with the, the speakers on the issues of collaboration, seeing how we can work together, having those regional bodies, as we do the transfer of skills and knowledge, looking beyond transfer of skills and also seeing how we can have joint projects with developing countries so that we have joint businesses and uh, the ability for these skills to be transferred and shared um, across uh, different, different, different regions. Uh, on the skills transfer, a lot of research and development, I think, should also back that so that locally we also start to develop uh, some of these technologies that are suitable to some unique circumstances within our regions. And uh, if you look at also the, the issue of the digital divide, it's still, as you said, even at basic level, mobile connectivity, people are moving to 5G globally, but within the African continent, are we there yet? Uh, and then with 5G comes, of course, the increased issues on cybersecurity because of the speed at which uh, it will be operating. And have we also uh, strengthened some of those uh, critical uh, things within uh, the African continent? So I think those are some of the things we could continue to do uh, to, to uh, leverage on what is happening in the developing countries and see how we, uh, in the developed countries and see how we can uh, grow this uptake within the African continent. Uh, thank you so much, Phyllis. Um, I think it's very clear that uh, there's it, it quite a lot that needs to be done uh, for, for Africa to be leveled up. 
to, in order for, for, every, for every country to come to a level where they can be advanced in ICT, which is very critical, especially now that we are speaking about the EFCFTA, where we are going to now trade as Africa, one Africa. So it's very important that we all are at least somewhere in terms of uh, you know utilizing utilizing ICT when you speak about the the, the, the e-commerce is very critical. More so that uh, currently we are having the you know we are face to face with the pandemic or restriction of movement. It's 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 a uh, it's it's a it's 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 it's, uh, it's really high. It's not easy for for business people even for the for, you know to to move around as as freely as they were before the. The, the pandemic. So I think it is very critical that we really look into the points that we had raised in terms of how can this be done. And I don't know if Charles, what you want to expound on that. I know you have touched on that a little bit during the introductory uh, time. So I don't know if you, you have more you want to add on to that. So please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, uh, Mantra. Uh... I would say like uh, one of the, question, the, the issues that I raised around the regional bodies and having a body of knowledge for Africa. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention is that we need to have a uh, ombudsman for regional ombudsman, whereby we will help, we'll be able to hold uh, international companies uh, that we leverage from uh, accountable, uh, especially from from pricing perspective, uh, African products, uh, I'm well aware, they, they are very resilient. Uh, typical example, you look at uh, the company like Dinel. Dinel has competed in most of the, uh, its product have competed in most of the, the global wars and has like uh, outsmarted most of the, what is regarded as the, as the best technologies. So, if we have a shared model and the regional bodies, uh, that will enable us to, to say that what we design, uh, even from pricing perspective, uh, we can eliminate the issue of uh, cost intense, uh, capital intense uh, processes of manufacturing from industry perspective, because of you will be having a, a pool of expertise not only from one country, but from different countries, as long as you know that uh, you have an oversight that can assist uh, even from authenticity and integrity of those institutions. And uh, in industries, uh, I will say like from product uh, manufacturing or service uh, rendering perspective, it's high time that they move towards uh, looking to say that you are digitizing and you're automating only. You need to build a resilient, a resilient services such that should you experience either a cyber attack or a compromise to your processes, then you have one way or the other to, 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 kill, to kill the impact or to sustain the impact without other business processes uh, suffering because there's nothing uh, painful like having to 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 close the whole organization in 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 terms of uh, to reboot or to to restart the whole factory. So you need to have a different. That's why I said like you need to protect the whole value chain uh, according to its requirements, such that uh, if you have an impact on one session on one business processes then other business processes can still function and the production can still uh, go on on the others uh, without impacting on the others. This will enable you, uh, even when you go globally, you can still compete, uh, you can still have a competitive edge because of your product are, are approved internationally according to their manufacturing standards and uh, they suit uh, they don't. They are not bound or binded by the the geolocation uh, reg regulation. Meaning that you would, have, if if you are in Africa, there's poor P, there's GDPR. Uh, you are not gonna worry to say like data privacy or whatever. Uh, you'll be compliant uh, even without like to say that I have to reassess my product uh, to to check if it uh, meets the regional jurisdictions laws of jurisdiction. So I, I think that's that's the best approach in terms of like 
using the minimal skill that we have in Africa uh, to the best to the best in terms of op optimizing our our product production uh, process. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. I think I'm going to throw you back this to you. Uh, you spoke about integrity, which I think, of course, uh, uh, Timothy somehow touched on it earlier when he said the private sector does not want to share information. I think it, it also goes back to an issue of integrity uh, within the, the, the ICT space, uh, especially that that data is a very sensitive subject. Uh, some companies, of course, exist because there's data that they have to to really protect or to, to utilize in their space. Uh, but where, where do we start? What can be done? What needs to be done, especially by the private sector to rise up to the occasion, to, to take away these doubts and, and actually uh, have the Africa that will of course integrate and actually collaborate in fact, uh, to ensure that uh, actually there is uh, a move uh, towards, uh, towards industrializing, I mean, towards utilizing ICT fully uh, within, within the African manufacturing sector. What needs to be done urgently? What is that low hanging food that needs to be caught quickly in order for the private sector in Africa to, to, to really rise up to the occasion? Is it yes. just the private sector or is it even the government has to, to play its very active role to allow or to enable private sector to, to rise up to the occasion? Yes, I, I would say like uh, it's a twofold uh, approach. It's a collaborated uh, view approach, and also a, a government will. Government will they like I said, you need to have a country uh, technology innovation uh, executive uh, who will champion the the interest of emerging companies. Uh, every government, its objective is to create where is to create jobs for its citizens and sustainable jobs. So government need to have a budget that will stimulate uh, innovation around emerging companies that uh, register or record a number of jobs that are there, they've created and also the, the products uh, that they have innovated uh, within the country that assist the country, not only to their benefit, but also that are adding value towards building a service delivery to, to the country, then that uh, technology, you know, technology innovation officer must have a budget that will fund those uh, innovate, innovation products. And also at some point, uh, waiver them from, from tax because of, we are well aware that uh, manufacturing is a capital intense process. So if the government uh, at least uh, give a waiver in, in some sort uh, that will enable emerging companies uh, such that the capital that they, they have at, at their uh, exposure, it's more channeled around making sure that uh, their product uh, get to realize, be realized within the market and it add value to, to the citizens at large. And it also help uh, cap the, the unemployment that exist in most of the countries, even though that we, we know that uh, in Africa, uh, employ, unemployment is, is, is the greatest case, I will say that, that we are trying to fight, but uh, it's a battle that is a huge elephant. So one way or the other, uh, we need to bring the, the SMEs uh, with a bit of funding and waiver from either uh, tax uh, to say that, this is the way you need to go. And you have oversight bodies that can assist and monitor uh, those SME to say that at the end of the day, uh, they, they don't survive to gain out of the fund, but they, they have longevity uh, within their stay and play in the market. Because if you look at the most of the government institution, the, the green contracts are the ones that are undermining uh, emergence and like Timothy said, uh, are the one that allow the dumping of uh, obsolete uh, technologies or because of, they know that we don't have the skill to analyze those, uh, to interrogate the bodies that will help uh, institution to interrogate those and even to question the, the pricing model in that regard. Thank you so much, Charles. Um, I, I think you really touched on very key points there. 
Um, and, and also, I think it's, it's, it's an issue of, again, uh, you know, unemployment, which of course, it's, it's a problem across the whole Africa. Um, you know, but then again, I, I'm going to throw it to you, Phyllis. Is it clearly defined? Um, the, the relationship between or the impact that uh, enabling ICT, especially by, by, by the, 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 uh, the, the facilitators of trade, uh, the government especially, is it really clearly defined on the, the relationship between the two? What, what much can be done uh, in, in terms of creation of employment if uh, smart technologies were actually embraced in real sense? Because I know from, from many uh, you know, experiences, it would be that we would have such policies which are very beautiful and they look very good on, on paper. But then again, we have an issue of implementation. Like what, what, what has been done when you go back, you look at the policy, this is a smooth, uh, beautifully designed policy. But when you look at the ground, things are a little bit you know, on the opposite. Is, is it very clear? <laughs> like, is it really um, clearly defined? Thing? Yes. Um, I think first, uh, just just to mention, you said something around jobs and ICT. There's, I mean, I mean, in technology, there's always been the question, especially in our continent, where we have very high youth unemployment, on whether technology, especially in the manufacturing sector, will reduce the ability of the sector to create the much needed jobs uh, within the country. So it's one of those debates that has always happened, and. Uh, over time, increasingly, the question should really be about the value that technology brings into the manufacturing sector and how increased efficiencies uh, that come from technology can actually support the sector to be able to grow much more so that even if you replace, because you won't be losing jobs, you'll sort of be replacing jobs in certain parts and moving them into other areas of production. And if we can use technology then for that competitiveness, uh, the ability then to take advantage of markets like the Africa continental market and the other global markets would then be possible. So technology would then act as an enabler. Uh, if you look at the issue of the policy and how it's implemented, I think Timothy was, at least on the part of Kenya, uh, quite clear about what is happening uh, and how these uh, policies are being implemented uh, within, with, within the country. So in Kenya, we have seen progress around uh, this space and, uh, and, and, and a lot of support. Uh, of course, there's still room to improve it uh, much more. And uh, the study I spoke about that we carried out earlier uh, did identify uh, additional areas that we can get government support beyond policy uh, around digital infrastructure support uh, and, and, and financing uh, so that when people or businesses are looking at completely transforming. We have, for example, sectors like our textile sector, which need upgradation of technology because a lot of them are operating on, on old obsolete technology. So the ability of government then to facilitate beyond the policy uh, and, and support businesses to actualize um, some, of, some of these things, I think is, is, is quite critical. Uh, and uh, the implementation of policies is uh, one of the challenges we'll always speak about in Africa that uh, the ability to fully implement then what we put down is a challenge. Uh, but if we involve uh, industry so that even the policies we develop, uh, they become as practical and as implementable as possible uh, by involving industry in the development of the design of, of the policy from the onset uh, so that it's easier to implement uh, some, some of these technologies. So that way, I think if we're able to show value uh, to, to industry and also have uh, their involvement uh, in development of uh, policies, the uptake will be much better. Thank you, Phyllis. I, th I think Kenya, Kenya was clearly a wrong country to pick uh, on this subject when it comes to implementation of policy, as, uh, <laughs> as Timothy has already attested to you earlier. Um, which is very commendable. I think it's, it's something that we should uh, maybe pick it up on and really see where we, we can learn from, from Kenya from their success story that they have, you have already shared. So I think it's really commendable uh, that you are doing really well when it comes to implementing your own policies that you have made. Um, so I think, Timothy, let's, let's jump on this one. Um, what, is, what has been the, the role of, 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 um, of the youth? They, they are, of course, as, as Phyllis has, has said uh, earlier, that they are the most disadvantaged. 
they are the, the most disadvantaged when it comes to employment. They are like, it's, it's like that in many countries across Africa. What would be their role uh, to, to in, in, in uh, enhancing uh, the uh, movement towards the smart manufacturing? What would they benefit from that? What would be their role and their benefit from that? Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think the youth have a big role to play. Um, one of the reasons possibly that we are not automating and going smart as fast as we could or as fast as we should is because we have an abundance of cheap labor. And so maybe there's no motivation to upgrade systems and machines to be able to produce more efficiently. So the youth have a big role to play. One would be maybe to demand uh, minimum compensation. And I think that would uh, push for you know, upgrade of systems and the manufacturing um, equipment. But another is innovation. And as I'd said earlier, uh, Madam Wakiaga, you need to open up your factories so that we have more youngsters on the shop floors. Uh, not only as employees, but also as uh, interns, as people who are learning, as people who are being engaged uh, in terms of re-engineering of the processes, which will inevitably cam come up with um, you know, automation. If you have somebody who's worked on a machine for 30 years, for 20 years, I'm sure they have very low incentive to you know, bring changes or improvements. But if you have a youngster, who has not been in the system, then it means they are bound to see things differently. They are bound to you know, suggest changes. And they are also bound to adapt uh, new technology very fast, given that uh, they've been using machines, they've been using computers, they've learned uh, about them in school. So it would be very quick. So I think the youth uh, need to be integrated in our systems in our factories, in our manufacturing plants, uh, and also they need to be encouraged to come up with innovations or suggest ideas for re-engineering so that uh, we can be able to, you know, see better plants. Most of the innovation that we've seen come from the youth, but because they are not in the factory or manufacturing setting, they always do small innovations, you know, uh, outside this environment. So I think that would be my uh, take on this. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. That was beautiful. I think, uh, as you said, it's, it's a question of embracing the youth. Uh, are we ready to embrace the youth? I know Charles Elias spoke about, uh, he touched on uh, an issue of uh, incorporating with the academics to ensure that this uh, ICT is embraced from the lowest uh, grassroots level. So, uh, Charles, are, are we ready to embrace the youth with their very innovative and very creative ideas that they have around ICT? Or we are still holding on to our own traditional ways of doing things? Are we ready, yes, Africa, to, to really allow our young ones to, to do what they, are, they have been trained to do in terms of, uh, you know, feathering us in, deeper into ICT? I think... <laughs> Together with the, a short summary, we, we are a bit behind time. Uh, so towards the end of what you say, just throw in a bit of a summary of, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, let me uh, give a context of South Africa. I will say like, yes, but uh, we still need to shake up the universities to, to come on board because if you look like the, the likes of Huawei, uh, they have a test lab whereby you can go and test your products. And so universities need to be given an opportunity to say that let the students uh, go and uh, try to innovate industrial projects uh, in those areas because of, in that way, you'll be bridging between the, the corporate world and the academical world such that uh, I think one of the, the problems in within Africa is to say that also the mentality around uh, internship, uh, it at some point need to be removed 
then thereafter you have employees, qualified employees to say that when they are from varsity, they can be plugged and play to, to the production belt to say that they understand what is happening within the, the production belt. And they are not going to say like, uh, follow someone who still have the legacy problems and, and be part of the, the value builder for, for the institution, because we are more around enabling uh, the, 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 the recipients of the service. Uh, so those are the things that we need uh, to shift. We need a, a psychological paradigm shift, uh, if I may say. Thank you. That was a beautiful summary. Uh, we literally a minute uh, away from our end time. So I'm going to give you two 10, 20 seconds, uh, Timothy, of your summary, then Phyllis, 20 seconds, and then we wrap up. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the very wonderful session. I think uh, we need to embrace uh, automation. We need to involve our youth. Uh, we need to upgrade our manufacturing plants and factories so that we produce more efficiently, use less energy, and have uh, better standards of uh, goods and services. Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, yes, I think uh, just to echo, we need to continue to uh, demonstrate the value in industry uh, taking technology, automation, and really taking full advantage of the fourth industrial revolution because there is value for industry and uh, build the skill sets. We do a lot in terms of uh, linking industry and academia at come and giving those opportunities for young people to be placed within industries. And it's adding a lot of value uh, in terms of the contribution. And lastly, we need to look at international policy coordination and collaboration, uh, because that will also go a long way in enabling organizations and countries to share knowledge and experiences, and also to address the opportunities and fully harness on uh, what exists uh, within this space. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. You, ladies and gentlemen, have been a very beautiful panel. We have learned quite a lot from you. And indeed, ICT is an enabler, not a goal, as you have all attested to. And it can also make us, you know, simplify our way to uh, making or achieving our desirable um, uh, ends, uh, of course, such as sustainability, uh, lowering the cost of production, and also encouraging faster construction and the production of whatever it is that we are producing within the manufacturing industry. I thank you so much. We have learned quite a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.